All right. Good morning. Sorry for the late start. Um, let's see if I can turn the. Well, oh, not bad. Sorry for the late start. Um, today we are going to talk about uh, tree models. So I showed them already uh, decision tree classifiers. I showed them already in the introductory in the introductory lecture. Um, but I didn't tell you what, uh, what algorithm we usually use to learn them. Uh, so that's what we're going to go into today. Uh, and we're also going to talk about model ensembles, which I hinted at earlier as well, which is the idea that if you have multiple models, um, can you somehow put them together to get a model that is better than the sum of their parts, right? Or at least as good as the sum of their parts. Can you combine models to make better models? Uh, these are completely orthogonal subjects. They're, you can do ensembling with any kind of uh, machine learning model, not just tree models, but they do tend to occur together. Most of the very successful um, ensemble models, specifically gradient-boosted decision trees, uh, are a combination of these two concepts, of decision tree learning uh, and ensembling. Um, and this is very specific, a very famous uh, algorithm. Basically, with all our talk of, of deep learning and how, how fun and how successful that is, if you want to win a Kaggle competition and you don't have a lot of time and you have to get to pick one algorithm, this is sort of the default algorithm. I mean, there's no free lunch and um, every data set requires its own algorithm and its own approach, but if you don't have time for that and if you have to pick one that you think uh, will give you the best performance, uh, then usually the, the sort of gospel is that gradient-boosted decision trees are the, the way to go. So that's basically what we're going to work towards today. We're going to end up with an explanation of how uh, this algorithm works. And to start with, oh, no, sorry. Uh, and to do that, we have this plan. So it's a very simple plan. We start with decision trees, which is simply a classifier based on a, a tree structure. We will briefly discuss regression trees, which as you can probably guess is a regression algorithm based on a tree structure. You can also do clustering with trees. Uh, we won't discuss that. But it's in the book if you're interested. Uh, so that's all the tree models we're going to talk about. And then we are going to talk about different ensembling methods, <laughs> namely bagging, boosting, stacking, and gradient boosting, which is the one that is often very successfully combined with decision trees. I think I turned these two around, so we might end up with stacking and do gradient boosting first. But first, um, let's talk uh, decision trees. And decision trees make most sense in the context of categorical features. So not numerical features, like we've um, done so far. Most of the time I've been talking about numerical features. Um, but for decision trees, it makes sense to start out with categorical features. So inspired by uh, last weekend's Oscar news, I made this example data set where we have on each row, we have a movie. In each column, we have a categorical feature, namely the age rating of the movie. Um, these are American age ratings, if you're not familiar with the system. it's. Uh, uh, G is general public, PG is parental guidance, so uh, a little bit scary or a little bit uh, something else. And R is uh, for adults only. And then there's genre, science fiction, drama, and romance. I've picked three random genres to keep it simple. Let's assume that these are mutually exclusive genres, uh, and these are the only genres that exist. And then just to give us an extra one, I've picked aspect ratio, which is the... Uh, ratio between the height and the width of uh, the picture. 
And then uh, our task is to predict the outcome, the outcome of the Oscar uh, ceremony. So is the movie overlooked? Has it been nominated for a, an Oscar or has it actually won an Oscar? That's a very simple uh, toy data set. I didn't go through the data, so the examples aren't realistic, but I hope you get the idea. So this is what we're going to build a classifier for. And we're not going to translate these to numeric features. We're going to do this directly on the categorical features. And this is what a decision tree looks like. Which is very simple. Basically, you have a bunch of nodes. You start at the top. Each node tests a feature, like genre. And for each possible value of that feature, uh, draws a path down to another node. At that node, you test another feature. And then at some point, you are done testing and you hit a leaf. And the leaves, leaves are labeled with outcomes. With outcomes, usually. Uh, so once you hit a leaf, let's say you uh, see a new movie, and you want to know, is it going to win an Oscar? So you look at the genre first, the decision uh, tree asks you, what's the genre? You say drama, so you move down here. Decision tree asks, what's the aspect ratio? Well, you say 239. And then the decision tree predicts this movie is going to win an Oscar. And that's all there is to it. That's the model. Uh, you can also put probabilities here if you want a probabilistic classifier. But we're not going to go into that today. It's a fairly straightforward extension of the model. But uh, for now, let's just say on each leaf there is a definite class prediction from the classifier. And the way these um, models are built are by uh, starting with an empty tree and extending first a root node and then every leaf with one feature, by choosing a feature to place here and to split the tree. So the question, the biggest question is, how do we split the features? What makes for a good split? Um, so let's look here. Let's imagine we are building a classifier from the start, so we're choosing uh, what feature to split on in the root node. And we are choosing between genre and rating. Let's just to uh, make it easy to visualize, let's forget about aspect ratio. Uh, if we do this, then we ha can draw this as this kind of table. So we have three genres and three ratings, which gives us nine segments. And here we have three overlooked, one nominated, and one win. That's what that means. Out of the whole data set, uh, five of them end up here. Three of them are overlooked. One is nominated, one has one. And at the start of our tree, these are the proportions. There are 23 overlooked, 12 nominated, and 11 won in the data set, and they're all going to go through this tree and be split up by their features. So now we can split this data set two ways, either by rating or by genre. If we do it by rating, we end up with this. So we split it like that there. And these are all grouped together. These are all grouped together. These are all grouped together. And these numbers, this 23, 12, 11, is broken, uh, is broken up into these three groups of three numbers. These, uh, this is the set of these numbers, this is the set of these numbers, and this is the set of these numbers. And what you see here is that if you split it like this, and you end up in, you see a, a, a new movie, and you use this sort of uh, very small decision tree, you follow the line, you end up in one of these leaves. What you see here is that you, um, the uh, um, choice of rating doesn't really tell you very much. Because whatever leaf you end up in, the relative distribution over the classes is roughly the same. So whether I split this by, uh, whether I split, uh, whether I end up in the PG, call, uh, the PG row or in the G row, it doesn't really matter the distribution, what, what distribution I expect over classes is still roughly the same for all of these guys. So I haven't really learned anything. I'm not really, uh, I don't really know anything, I don't really know that much more once I hit one of these leaves about what class to, uh, I can best assign to this movie I've seen. Whereas, 
if we split by genre, so we split like this, uh, then we get very different numbers because genre is a very predictive, uh, in this data set, a very predictive attribute, a very predictive feature. Because, for instance, if a movie is sci-fi, as we can see here, it never wins an Oscar. Uh, roman romance almost never wins an Oscar, and drama has a big chance of winning an Oscar. And you can see this in the class probabilities that you get if you split by genre. So the takeaway here is that what we're looking for <coughs> in a split is um, non-uniform class distributions. So these class distributions are all relatively uniform, or as uniform as the distribution that we started out with. And these distributions are very non-uniform, so they tell us something. They tell us here, we really have a very good choice of getting it, uh, chance of getting it right, if we follow the sci-fi uh, line. We really have a very good choice of getting it right if we pick the, um, the highest class here, <coughs> red. Because in this leaf, the class distribution has become very non-uniform. It, it has converged towards this, uh, this red class. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for splits that give us non-uniform class distributions. And then once we've done this, we've chose, let's say we chose genre, we can extend. We can extend the tree, we can pick one of these leaves, and for this leaf, pick a, a feature to split on at that leaf. And then we get something like this. And we call this little section of the uh, instance space, the feature space, we call that a segment, which is just this, the subset of the data set that is selected by this leaf is this segment. Just a word to help us, uh, help us describe this thing. So this is the basic principle. You look for good features that split your data set into non-uniform classes, uh, class distributions, Start with an empty tree, you extend it step by step by step by step, extending every leaf. Uh, and you do it uh, greedily, so you find the best one, you apply it, and there's no going back. Uh, at first, at least, in principle. So no backtracking, just until you uh, hit the stop condition, you keep extending, choosing the split that creates the least uniform distribution over the class labels in the resulting segments. Uh, I'll describe the stop conditions in a second. And you just keep doing this and then you get a tree. And that's how you uh, train a tree classifier. So I'll give you the stop conditions in a second and we have to define how we measure this, uh, this uniformity of a distribution. How do we measure which split gives us the least uniform distribution? But first, a few things to note just to make sure you get the basic principle. Uh, we don't have to split, we don't choose our feature by level. So on the first level we split by genre. We can split by rating if the movie is a, um, what was it, is a roman uh, is romance, and by aspect if the movie is drama. And we can even choose not to split at all if it's a science fiction movie. That's all a lot. So for every single leaf, you judge um, independently what the next best feature is. So if you keep extending this, you have six new leaves for which to pick a new feature. Except that this kind of thing doesn't make very much sense. In the, the story where you, uh, the, the setting where the features are categorical, <coughs> it doesn't make a lot of sense to split by genre, then by rating, and then by genre again. Why not? Because if you follow this, uh, this tree for a new movie, and you say, well, the genre is romance, the rating is um, PG, I think, whatever the green one was, once you end up here, you already know the genre. Every movie that's going to end up here is going to have genre romance, so no movies are going to actually get split or end up in any of these two leaves on the right. Um, so in this setting, it doesn't make sense to reuse features uh, the deeper you go down the tree. So stop conditions, <coughs> when we stop extending the tree. Well, obviously, when we've used all the inputs. So here, if we can't use an input more than once, 
this tree for our data set, we only have three features. I should call them features, not inputs, sorry. So if we only have three features, the tree can only be three steps deep, right? Because we're not using a feature more than once. Uh, so if you've used all the features, if all the f uh, instances in our segment have the same inputs for the features, then we can stop. We don't extend the, uh, the leaf and we output the majority class in our segment. The class that occurs most often in our segment. Uh, the second stop condition is when all the outputs are the same. So when all the, uh, when in our segment the class distribution is completely uniform, there's only one class that occurs in our uh, segment, then we can also stop. And we also output the majority class, which in this case is that one class that is left over. So then we have one thing left to do, and that is to define this uh, uniformity. Yep. Um, so if you only have two classes, this is quite easy, right? Then a perfect 50-50 split is a perfectly uniform class distribution. And the further you are away from that 50-50 split, the less uniform your class distribution are, is. So that's fine. Uh, but if you have more than two classes, it gets a little difficult. You get si situations like this, where here we have a, a propor uh, the red class takes 50% uh, of the outputs in the segment, and the other ones are exactly equal. So these are quite uniform, but this one is much bigger than the others. Here the uh, red and orange are a bit more uniform, but the blue is much smaller. So it becomes much more difficult to gauge which of these two is the most uniform. So we need a, a more uh, principled approach to define this. <coughs> and for that we have to go back to the um, first lecture on probability blue, where we learned about entropy. And entropy is a property of a probability distribution, uh, which you can uh, define as the expected code length. It's defined like this, the, probability, uh, the sum of the probabilities times the logarithms of the probability, so it's the expectation of the negative logarithm of the probability. Uh, but more uh, practically, what it expresses is the uniformity of your distribution. It expresses how many uh, bits you need to encode something from a distribution optimally. And if you don't know anything about your distribution, i.e. your distribution is fully uniform, then the entropy is maximal. And the more uneven and the more oddly shaped, so the more you know about your distribution, the more you know about the outcome. For instance, here we know that A is going to be very likely on the right. The more you know about your outcome, the lower the entropy uh, becomes. So we can use entropy uh, to look at this class distribution of a split and see is this a good, uh, is this a good split to choose. Uh, for that we need to extend the concept of entropy a little bit into conditional entropy. So we know about conditional probability, right? That's this. So we have uh, a probability over the random variable outcome, that's what we're trying to predict. Uh, the probability that somebody's won, for instance, that the movie has won, uh, given any of the features, in this case, given the genre. So this is just basic conditional probability. Uh, if we fix the conditional, so if we set the conditional to drama and we take the uh, probability over the outcome, we can just define the entropy over that specific probability distribution. So write it down like this. This is just the entropy over this distribution on O, where O goes over the three possible outcomes, overlooked, nominated one. Uh, this is just entropy. It's not, uh, nothing special, special yet, just entropy over this distribution which happens to be conditioned on drama. But now if we turn drama, so here we've turned outcome into a variable, if we turn genre into a variable as well, we get the conditional entropy which is defined like this. 
uh, the expected entropy under this conditional G. So basically what this tells you is um, I want to know the entropy of O. And I know that somebody is going to tell me the value of G. I don't know it yet, but somebody is going to tell me. After they've told me, what is my expected entropy on O? Uh, so I don't know what G is going to be yet, but after I know it, I expect to have this entropy on O. And then we define something called the information gain, which is the difference between the entropy before they've told me G and the entropy after they've told me G. So independent of what G is going to be, how much information am I going to get out of the fact that they've told me G? That's the information gain. So that's a bit abstract, maybe. Um, the formula is very simple. If you call this uh, segment S, so let's say this is part of a decision tree with something above it, something below it. We call the thing above it the, the uh, part of the data set that hits this node, we call that S. So this is, this, this is all of the data that hits this node. Call that S. Uh, so we interpret this as a distribution. These are relative frequencies, but we can interpret that as a distribution. <coughs> and H of S is the entropy of that distribution. Uh, what we then do to compute the information gain is we look at all of the, the information gain of the split genre, of the feature genre. So we look at all of these segments that result from the split. We sum the entropy of each one. And we weight it by the relative probability of ending up there. So SI over S is the, rel is the probability of starting here and ending up here. S I, that would be the size of SR over the size of S. So if, uh, if this is a um, very unlikely path to take, if almost no movies at this point are romance movies, then this value here would be very small and the entropy of this set would not factor into the expected entropy very much. So that's information gain. <coughs> and it tells us how much we reduce the entropy by picking a particular split, by picking a particular feature to split the tree. That's by far the most popular way to uh, measure to use in building decision trees, but not the only one. Uh, <coughs> Flak gives us these two others, so you can pick the minority class. <coughs> so you pick the... Um, uh, you compute the error rate, assuming that you pick the largest uh, in your segment. You pick the majority class here. What's your error rate? What's your expected error? You try and minimize that. Uh, or you can use something called the Gini index, which is the expected error rate under random guessing. Uh, these are all explained in, in Flag on page uh, 134. We won't go into them here, because almost all of the time people use information gain in decision trees. So here's the final algorithm, just to make it a bit more specific. You start with a single root node, which is a leaf, an unlabeled leaf. And you go through a loop, you go through all the unlabeled leaves until there are no unlabeled leaves left. And for each unlabeled leaf, you either label it or split it. Uh, if the stop condition is reached, then you label it with the majority class of its segment. If not, then you check all the features that haven't been used yet. You find the one with the highest information gain and you split it on that, giving you a couple of new leaves. And then you loop again and <coughs> you keep doing this until you hit the stop condition for the entire tree. <coughs> so that's basic decision tree learning. Uh, oh, as slightly too early, actually, because there's one thing left to talk about, which is what if you have numeric features? So all of this was just about categorical features, but what if some of your features are numeric? Maybe all of your features are numeric. Um, you can still use decision trees. 
And what you usually do is you turn the feature into a binary split on some threshold. So you pick some number, <coughs> and if uh, uh, well you're following for a new instance, you're following it down the tree, you hit this node. If feature x for your instance is lower than t, you go to the left. If feature x is higher th than t, you go to the right. <coughs> and you just find the thresholds. Uh, you only check uh, one threshold, which is the one that gives you the highest information gain. You just uh, you can prove that it's one uh, that it has to be between two examples that have a different. Um, a label. So if you put all your instances in your training data along this feature X, you only have to check this point, this point, this point, this point, uh, and you only have to check points between two uh, instances with different labels. <coughs> and you check all of them, you find which one gives you the highest split, and that's the the only threshold you consider and you compare it to the other possible features. And then you get something like this, which is what I showed you in the uh, introductory lecture. Uh, a decision tree where on each node, or at least on each node representing a f uh, numeric feature, you check a certain value, and then at the uh, leaves you uh, hit a class judgment, and then you're the shape that you're essentially drawing in feature space looks like this. So it's uh, sort of piecewise axis aligned line segments that make up your decision boundary. A little kind of staircase y thing. And if you do it for real, I mean, this is just drawn by hand, but if you do it for real, you usually get quite big decision trees like this. This is for the example data I showed in the lecture, in the introductory lecture. And as you can see, this is quite strongly overfitting, right? There's not a lot to learn in this data, and it's drawing a lot of needless details that don't really make a lot of sense given the data. Which we see a lot in decision trees. So they're very powerful models, we use them a lot. But they are extremely prone, especially if you use them by themselves. If you use a single decision tree, they are very prone to overfitting. So what we see here is the accuracy if we uh, clip the uh, allowed size of the tree, if we limit the allowed size of the tree, and we look at the accuracy, and we plot that allowed size of the tree <coughs> against the accuracy, we see that the training data goes up the bigger we let the tree become. But our validation uh, or test data, our um, result on the test data, goes down. So this is classic overfitting. We, so long as we're only looking at the training data, we think we're doing great. And then when we see some new data, it turns out we're doing terribly poorly. Um, so we need some way to deal with this. We need to test for this, and we need some way to deal with this. Um, and the standard way to deal with this is by pruning based on a validation set. So you withhold some data from your tree learning algorithm. And once you've learned your whole tree, you've reached the subconditions, you go back from the uh, from the leaves, back up, and at every <coughs> node, you check: does the tree with this node perform better on the validation data than the tree without this node? And if the tree without this node performs better, I cut it, and I label the resulting leaf. I label the resulting leaf with the majority class. So it's just basic: you withhold some data, and you use your data to. You use your withheld data to check your model. Um, the only thing that's important here is that we are doing a lot of different things with our data. So as I told you already, and I hope you remember, this is really probably the most important thing I've told you uh, over these last few weeks. You split your data first into training and test data. And you use your test data only for final testing, only once. Don't overuse your test data. Then you want to do some hyperparameter selection. So you want to test a few algorithms. You want to test whether you use decision trees or support vector machines. 
and some neural networks, logistic regression. That's also a hyperparameter selection, which algorithm you use. And then for each of those, you want to select some hyperparameters. For your support vector machines, you want to set your C value for your, uh, uh, what else do we have for your k nearest neighbor? You want to set your k value. So for that, you need a validation set. So you split your training data that you got here into a validation and an actual training data. And then when you start training your classifiers, your decision tree classifiers, you want to split your data again to control your search algorithm. In this case, to prune your uh, trees. You don't want to do that on this validation uh, data, because then you are making an unfair comparison. Because the support vector machines, as it were, don't get access to the validation data during search, only to select the hyperparameters. And your decision trees do, so that's not fair. So if you want a fair comparison, you need to split it again into another validation set. Uh, this happens also in neural networks. I didn't talk about it, but there's something called early stopping, where you decide how quickly to stop training. There again, you have to split up a separate validation set for controlling your search algorithm. This is very easy to do. If you just uh, get some training data, forget about the validation data, give it to SK Learn and say, give me a decision tree and by the way, prune it a little, SK Learn will do this automatically. But if you're implementing it yourself, you need to make sure you understand this kind of thing. Okay. Now we can talk about re regression trees. So now our data, well, data is the same, features are the same. But the target value is different. We are trying to predict the box office taking. So how much money is the movie going to make? Which is a numeric target feature. So our splits are the same. We don't have to worry about numeric features. But we do have to worry about, oh, that's too complicated. We do have to worry about the target value. So what's changing is that our instance space is no longer, the segments no longer contain class distributions, they contain numeric values. Uh, so we can't use this entropy trick anymore. We cannot use entropy to define the uniformity of our distribution because all the outcomes are going to be likely, all the outcomes are, are going to be different. So the simplest way to do this and the way this is al almost always done is just to replace entropy by variance. So here going in, we have a bunch of numbers, and they have a certain variance. And going out, this is split into subsets. And then the question is, what is the expected, uh, if I go through this with a, with a new number, what is the expected variance I'm going to get? So the variance of the, uh, the subsets weighted by the probability of ending up in that particular leaf. Uh, which is a very natural way to do it because what we want to end up with here is a certain, uh, a certain answer or an answer with as much certainty as we can give it. So the closer these numbers here are together, the better because then we can just pick the mean, give that as an outcome. And if the variance is low, then we're very sure that those numbers are uh, going to be, well, then those numbers are all close to the mean, so we're sure that that mean is going to be correct. If the variance is very big here, then we can also expect that all the numbers that end up here are very far away from the mean over this set. And we're not very sure that the outcome is going to be correct. Uh, yeah, and like I said, we label the leaves with the mean over the set. So once we hit a leaf, once we say we're going to stop splitting, we look at the segment we've reached and we label it with the mean of that segment. So in one dimension that looks a little bit like this. This is what I showed you also in the introductory lecture. Uh, these are not very good examples. These, are, these don't uh, show decision trees and regression trees in very good light because I was trying to illustrate overfitting, but um, in principle, what you get here is a tree on just one feature. But if you have numeric features, I forgot to tell you this, it does make sense to split multiple times. 
So you can reuse the same feature at multiple points in the tree because you can use a different threshold every time. So this didn't make sense with the categorical features because you split once and then the split has happened. But here you can split multiple times on the same feature, which is just on the vertical axis here, horizontal axis here. So you can split multiple times on that feature and you get basically a tree that divides your feature space into these intervals. And each interval is labeled with the mean of the training data on that interval. And you get a very sort of very jumpy approximation of a line, which probably needs to be pruned a little bit. Uh, and if you have more than one feature, it looks a little <coughs> bit like this. So again, a kind of staircase thing, but in two dimensions. Uh, my last slide before the break. So just to set you up for what we're going to do now. Most of the time these days we don't use decision trees. Because, uh, especially because they're very unstable. So the decision trees that you're going to get out of a learning problem depends a lot on very small details. So if I change one detail in the data set, if I remove one instance or if I add one instance, it may well be that the decision tree I get and the classification performance I get are completely different, are completely changed. They're very unstable. Or in other words, the uh, error has very high variance. So what we usually do is we make a, a random forest or a decision forest, which as you can probably guess is a collection of decision trees. And we let them make a decision together, which is an ensembling method. And that's what we're going to talk about after the break. We're a little early today, but I will see you back here in 15 minutes and then we'll continue with that. <laughs> okay, um, let's get started again. So we talked about um, decision trees, regression trees, and we ended up with the conclusion that they are highly un uh, very powerful but highly unstable learners, uh, and that it helps quite often to combine, the, to learn, to train many of them and to combine them into uh, what's called an ensemble, and to make the ensemble do the classification. Um, so what we have here is basically the idea that uh, one learner by itself is not very good. There's a certain error. And to avoid that error, we want to combine many learners to make the error lower. Now, as we've seen before, we can decompose error into two problems, into a problem of bias and a problem of variance, which are two very different problems. This is the dartboard analogy that is often used. Basically, low bias, low variance is just a good, uh, good learner. High bias, high variance is a, just a terrible learner, so don't look at those. But high variance is uh, when your hits, your errors, are very spread out. But if you were to average over many of them, you would end up with a good, uh, a good result. And high bias is when every individual result, uh, sorry, no. High bias is when the results are very precise. If you do the same thing with slight changes, slight differences, you get exactly the same result. But that result isn't very good, like here. So you're very accurate, you're just not accurate in the right place. Uh, so that's bias and variance. I'll give you another example. If you look at the way we grade, we are going to grade your report, we have sort of the same problem. We can grade in two different ways. We have this rubric, which tells us, which is sort of step-by-step -step computer program that tells us this is what the grade should be. And you can follow it blindly. And if we did that, we would get a very precise answer that would be exactly the same every time. So if I make the TAs just follow the rubric and do whatever the rubric says, then they, get, they all get the same, exam, the same uh, answer for your report. So you get very low, buy, uh, very low variance. But you might have done lots of cool stuff in your report that we didn't think of, that we didn't think to put in the rubric. I mean, the rubric is just like a stupid computer program. It doesn't see how 
great your work is. It doesn't see how much effort you put into the topography. It doesn't see the cool statistical tricks you used. It doesn't see how cool your data set is. Uh, so you might deserve a very high grade, but we just didn't think of all these things in the rubric, so you don't get a high grade. So we get high bias, but low variance, because the result is the same every time. Uh, if, I tell the t if I don't do that, if I say, well, that's unfair, and I tell the TAs, you grade it the way you feel, then the TA might pick up on all of the cool stuff you did that we didn't think of beforehand, because they're human beings and they can do this thing a bit better than, than machines can or rubrics can. But it does depend on the TA, whether or not they notice how much effort you put into your plots and how nice your topography is. So you get a very high variance because it depends on the TA and the grades will vary a lot. Uh, but if I were to make five TAs mark every report, <coughs> then we would get a low bias. Then we would see that the bias is very low and on average they would all average out to the right grade. Uh, so this is why we do a rubric the way we do it. We have both the rubric and the TAs in hopes of sort of combining this a little bit and then uh, catching both these problems. Because here, as in normal machine learning, we only get one dart. This is what would happen if we threw multiple darts, but we only get one. So from one dart, you cannot tell whether you are here or here. You can only tell there's an error, but not whether you're high variance or high bias. You can only tell that for a particular learner by looking at multiple data sets. So if we look at the behavior in general of decision tree learning, we know, well, that has uh, low bias but high variance. If we look at the behavior in general of basic linear classifiers, we know, well, they have high bias but low variance. So the question is, and let's start with the unstable learner, so let's start with the high variance case. If we know this, if we know that our learner has high variance, can we somehow fix this? Can we somehow train many of them, do this, throw multiple darts, and then somehow average the results in such a way that the error is also averaged? Because this is the, uh, the error that we want to average, but the output of the classifier is not the error, the output is a classification. So this is the simplest problem, and we, are, we deal with an unstable learner. Uh, which is another word for a high variance. Basically what I said earlier, if you change a little bit about the data set or a little bit about the setup, you get a very different example. Small changes lead to very big, uh, big changes in error. Um, so here we have two problems. First, how do we train multiple learners such that they're actually different? Because if the data set is exactly the same and the algorithm is exactly the same, then we actually get, and we train a learner 10 times on it, we actually get this exactly the same model 10 times, so that's not useful. We do need to make these small changes so that we actually get different models. So how do we do that? And second, once we have it, once we have these 10 different models, how do we combine them into one model that gives us one output? So for the first question, uh, cast your mind back to the methodology 2 lecture where we had a similar problem, where we wanted to measure the variance of our results. We wanted to actually measure this, but we only have one dart, so how do we measure this? Well, one way to do this is to resample our data, to, sam to uh, take our training data and to resample from it a data set that is a bit like that data. It's basically saying, we sample a data set of the same size as the whole data set, but sample with replacement. So every time we sample a point, we put it back, and then we sample a point and we put it back, and we do that until our sample data set is the same size as the original data set, which means that about 63.2% uh, of our original data set will be included in our sample data set, and the rest will be multiples, will be sampled multiple times, will be included multiple times. And then you can repeat your experiment on each bootstrapped example. Uh, these are important caveats in this case as well. So some classifiers will respond poorly to duplicate instances. 
But now we have, we can make 10 different data sets that are all slightly different, but still look like they're from the uh, data distribution. This is called bagging, short for bootstrap aggregating. So basically, very simple algorithm. You resample the data set k times. You train a model on each, so you get a big bag of k models. And that's our ensemble. And then when you get a new point to classify, you ask every model in your ensemble, what class should I assign to this point? And usually you just classify by majority vote. And that's backing. Uh, if you do this, it's, easy to, it's nice uh, to visualize if you do this with linear classifiers. So forget about the trees for a second. And let's imagine we train five, yes, five basic linear classifiers on this data. It's kind of a weird plot with lots of background noise, but these points here are the data points, so not very many data points. We train five linear classifiers on bootstrapped samples from this data. We get this result. If we then, between these, between these five classifiers, take a majority vote for every point in the plane, what we see is that if we are here, for instance, the majority vote tells us it should be blue. And if we're here, the majority vote tells us it should be red. So the decision boundary that you end up with is not linear, but piecewise linear. You get a sort of, it goes from here to here, and then faster down a bit, and then like that. So you, uh, out of this ensemble, you get a piecewise linear decision boundary that no single instance in the ensemble could have designed, could have uh, represented by itself. Uh, yeah, we can also replace this, uh, this rule of uh, majority voting by probabilities, so we turn it into a probabilistic classifier. So if three out of the five uh, members of our ensemble say that the class should be blue, then we assign the class blue probability three over five. And uh, it's a bit difficult to see in this picture, but what you get is every a uh, linear segment of the instance space here gets, uh, gets its own probability. And these big segments here get probability fully blue. So here the probability blue is one, and here the probability red is one. And for each of these little polygons in the middle, you get a different prob probability. So that's basically how bagging operates. That's bagging. So then the question arose, begging was uh, discovered pretty quickly. Then the question arose, what if you don't have high variance, but you have high bias? So your classifiers, your learners always do the same thing. Uh, they're not unstable. But uh, uh, they're wrong, basically. What can we do then? Can we still use this kind of ensembling technique to uh, combine lots of these guys into something that is not the average, that doesn't give you the average error of all these guys, because that's not what we want. But you use lots of these guys to end up in the middle, to end up with a low error. So you need something a bit more clever than bagging there, because if you just average things, then you're going to end up in the middle of this point cloud. Uh, and this was called the hypothesis boosting question, which is why the resulting algorithms that do this for us, that solve this problem, are called boosting algorithms. And step one for all boosting algorithms is to add a column to your data set, which we'll label W for weights. And this is what we are going to modify. This is what we're going to play with in sequence. So we give a weight to every point in our data set. And at the start, our weight is just one for every data set. So every, uh, every instance in our data set. So every instance is weighted equally, is equally important. And the basic, the general algorithm of boosting is very simple. We start with some classifier M0, just our first classifier. It's not very, uh, it doesn't have to be very good. And then for t from 1 to k, so let's say we want an ensemble of k 
our k plus 1 models. That's just a hyperparameter. Uh, we were going to train a sequence of classifiers. So we're not going to do this in parallel, like in bagging. We're going to train one classifier after another. And at each point, at each point t, we look at all the classifiers that have come before, and we look at how much do they misclassify the data set, which bits do they get wrong, Where are they, uh, what are they bad at. So we look at all the classifiers from m0 to mt minus 1. We look at which things they get wrong, and we increase the weight of those examples. We normalize the weights, we make sure they sum to 1, so that the weights give us a probability distribution over the data. And on this reweighted data, we train a new classifier. Uh, and a classifier that takes into account the weight, so that says, if the weight of this instance is high, I consider it more important. So that depends on the classifier, how you do that, how a classifier responds to reweighted data. For some classifiers, like a linear classifier, you can incorporate this very naturally into your classifier. And you can just, uh, if you think of these residuals that we always draw, you can just make a residual for a strong data point, make it pull more on the line than a residual for a, a data point that has a low weight. Sometimes if that's not natural, what you can do is you can resample your data according to the weights. So you resample a new data set from the old data set, but you sample by these weights so that the, new, uh, the probability of including uh, an instance depends on its weight. And the more an instance gets misclassified, the more likely it is to be included in this resample data. So anyway, you do that. You uh, pick one of these options. You train a new model, MT. You assign MT a weight, depending on how well it performs. So the better it performs, the higher its weight. And then once you hit K, once you have the ensemble of the size that you were going for, you make it vote weighted by A, AT specifically. So each vote, each, uh, each member of the ensemble gets a vote, but the vote is weighted by AT. So if the performance was good, if the error was low, then the uh, model MT gets a higher weight in the final vote. So this is a very general algorithm, and there's lots of ways to instantiate this, lots of choices to make for these things that I've described very vaguely. Uh, this is the basic boosting algorithm as Flack describes it in the book. So let's go with that. Basically, once you start training A, you have a certain probability by these weights over your distribution. So under that probability, you can estimate the error of uh, the previous classifier. So under the current weighting of the data, uh, ET is the probability of a misclassification. So for every weight, for every misclassified weight, you update the, sorry, for every misclassified instance, I, you update its weight like this. So here you see if the error is 0 0.25, then the weight gets increased, right? Uh, and then you'll renormalize later, so you can just boost the weights a little bit, and all the weights that aren't boosted will end up lower in the end because we renormalize later. And then the weight for the model MT is defined like this. And you can work out why this is a, a good way to do it by um, uh, taking the derivative, setting it equal to zero. Flag does that in the book if you're interested, but we won't go it in. We won't go into it now. All you need to see is that the uh, closer the error is to 1, the lower the weight gets. So if this is very close to 1, this becomes very close to 0. This becomes 0 over something. Uh, so this becomes very low. That's all you need to know. So that's a basic boosting algorithm. But the basic idea is that you train a sequence of classifiers, and each classifier pays attention, pays more attention to the instances in your data set that the previous classifier got wrong. That's the basic idea of boosting, and this is just implementation. The fun thing about boosting is that it works even if 
the classifiers are very bad. If, you, if your classifiers are so-called weak learners, so they just they get uh, their classification performance is only just above chance. So if you have binary classification, they you can expect them to get 51% uh, right. Even then, boosting works. You can pro it provably works. Not just empirically, it, you can prove that it works. And you, your ensemble, even though all the individual learners are very weak, your ensemble will still be very strong. That's very useful because weak learners are often very cheap to train. You can use, for instance, what are called decision stumps, which are decision trees with just one node. So if you have a decision tree with one node, it's called a decision stump. You can train a huge bag of these decision stumps because they're very cheap to train. Uh, not a bag, uh, an ensemble, boosted ensemble. And you can still get very powerful classifiers. Uh, and you see things like um, boosted ensembles uh, doing uh, face recognition with classifiers that look at just one pixel on the image. But if you just boost a huge ensemble of lots of them, you can still get a very good face classifier. So that's, uh, uh, yeah, that's boosting. There's lots of ways to instantiate this, lots of ways to do this. Uh, one of the most popular ones is AdaBoost, which is very close to this, but I, not quite the same. Uh, there's Logit Boost Brown Boost, which is a non-convex way of doing this. And then Gradient Boosting, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, but uh, this is a, another picture from the book, which shows the difference between boosting and banging. So on the right here, we have bagging on this data set. So a linear classifier on this data set doesn't give you a lot of variance. All the classifiers are roughly the same. So as you can see, bagging doesn't really change anything. Because all these classifiers are trained in parallel on roughly the same data, so you don't get a lot of benefit from combining them. Averaging all these classifiers gives you just more or less the classifier that you see already. Whereas if you do boosting, you get lots of very different lines. Uh, it trains, let me see, it's an ensemble of boosted linear classifiers from blue to red. So it starts with the blue line, which is a normal classifier. But then it uh, reweights the data set by the ones it got wrong. So you can see that the, if you look only at the difficult points in your data, the um, decision boundary sort of angles over all the way to that way, which is sort of what the, um, uh, sort of the difference between the basic classifier and all these more fancy classifiers that we talked about in the linear classification. We talked about support vector machines and uh, logistic regression. What makes them better than the least squares classifier and the basic linear classifier is that they only pay attention to points near the decision boundary, right? Or they pay disproportionate amounts of attention to the points near the decision boundary. If you train a support vector machine on this data, it would only pay attention to these points and it would forget about these points. Which is sort of what boosting also does. If you train a basic linear classifier on using boosting, then the first generation will pay attention to all your data, but the second one will pay much more attention to the data near the boundary and increasingly so, until you get this, uh, well, even this line here. Um, so in that sense, uh, if you start with a weak learner, boosting gives you this, uh, gives you this, this property of paying attention to the difficult to classify points. So that's very useful. Uh, like I said, the uh, most popular method to use in this space these days is called gradient boosting. I'll try and give you a very simple um, intuitive introduction to gradient boosting, which is best explained in the context of regression. So I've been talking about classification for a while, so switch your mind over, we're doing regression now. We have in this picture one single, in, one single feature X, one output y, which we're trying to predict, and we have a basic linear model that says for this x, predict this uh, y. We have some points in our data set 
which are the purple points here. And then uh, once we have a model, this line, we can draw our residuals, which is how far uh, the point in our data set, this is what we should have predicted, how far that is from what we did predict. Those are our residuals. It's just basic linear classification, which we've been doing for weeks. And we want to minimize the squared sum of these, uh, these residuals. That's our loss function, usually. So the basic idea behind gradient boosting, the basic intuition, is that once you've fitted one linear model, you can look at these residuals and try and fit those as well. So you say, I've fitted a simple model. What's left over? What's left over to describe of my data? So you subtract whatever your model predicted from the residuals. And then you get a data set consisting of just your residuals. And you can fit a line through that. So now you get a second line that gives you your residuals. And if you take this line and sum this line, then you get, well, I didn't plot it, but then you get a better fit, a better fitting model, right? So obviously you can iterate this. So now we have this, we have new residuals here. How far away is this line? We can separate those out, and we can plot the line through that. And usually you need to make sure that your model is uh, capable of becoming a little bit more complicated at each iteration. So if you just keep doing this with l linear models, then the end result will be the sum of lots of different linear models, which will be just a single linear model, so that doesn't work. Um, but if you do this with something that is actually capable of, of uh, becoming more complicated every iteration, like a regression tree, then you can get a very powerful fit to your data this way. So this is the, uh, the gradient boosting uh, algorithm for least squares. Basically, we start with some initial model. Usually, the initial model is just a constant. It just predicts some constant for everything, which is just like, well, usually the mean of your data is a good, uh, is a good thing to predict. So that's not a very powerful model, but we're going to extend it anyway with lots of these uh, residual models, with k of these residual models specifically. So from 1 to k, we compute all the residuals. We call those ri. So for every point in our data set i, we have a residual. So then we get a data set not from xi to yi, but from xi to ri. We fit some model, mt, to that. And then our next model in the ensemble, we build the ensemble step by step. Our next model is the previous model plus mt weighted by some yt, uh, sorry, gamma t. And gamma t, it's a technical detail, but we find gamma t by minimizing uh, the loss over this model through something called line search, which is a little bit like a random search. You don't need to worry about that. So we find a good value for this gamma t, because if we sum this model with this model, this one might not fit the residuals very well. So we need to figure out how much of this model we want to add to this one, in order to minimize the loss. We get some fit, but it might not be a very good fit. So in some cases, we don't want to add anything at all. So here we have a little optimization problem inside to figure out how much of this new model we want to fit, uh, we want to add, sorry. So this looks a, bit, a little bit complicated because you're constantly adding new models, but if you write this out, it actually shows you that you're getting, just getting a, a weighted sum over all your trained models. So once you hit your third, let's say k is three, once you hit your third trained model, that's defined, so m3 is defined as m2 plus small m3 times gamma three. And then m3, uh, m2 you can write out using this again. It splits out into gamma two m2, and then gamma one m1, and this is ultimately the ensemble that you end up with. So it's really nothing but a sequence of weighted models. And these weights are, are learned by this optimization. Uh, why is it called gradient boosting, you might ask? Where's the gradient? Well, that comes from a slightly unintuitive insight that if you look at your loss function like this, this is your loss function, right? The output of some model 
minus the uh, output that it should have said squared. So it's a loss function for just one uh, for just one example. If you take the derivative with respect to the output of your model, you end up with this with your residual. So this is a way to generalize it to situations where your loss function isn't least squared, least squares. So if your loss function is uh, cross entropy, for instance, the question is what should my residuals be? What should I fit to? Well, you take the derivative and you figure out, and then this should take the place of your residuals. That's how you apply gradient boosting to different loss functions than least squares. That's why it's called gradient boosting. Uh, but if you're not interested in, in using this on other loss functions, you can just think of it as fitting, uh, fitting lines to the residuals in sequence. Oh, sorry. So let's see where we are. We've talked about bagging, we've talked about boosting, and we've talked about gradient boosting. So now we know how to win Kaggle competitions before we move to stacking, which is the final topic. So if you want to make lots of money on, money on Kaggle, you need to be really good at gradient boosting. Because gradient boosting uh, is just a really good way to improve performance. If you want to uh, do machine learning research, and you want to be a famous machine learning researcher, usually you stay away from boosting. Because boosting, we know, is a way to inflate your performance or to improve your performance. But when you're actually designing new models and coming up with new ways of doing stuff, um, you want to uh, investigate, you want to uh, do experiments on these models without boosting. Because everybody knows, yes, okay, I have this model. If I boost it, then it's going to get better. But if I want to compare how this model does to some other model, you compare it without boosting, right? You compare the model in isolation. So if you look at the machine learning research, unless it's research specifically about ensemble methods, you will never see anybody doing boosting because we want to look at the model in isolation. But if you look at Kaggle and if you look at who wins Kaggle competitions, uh, I don't think any Kaggle competition is ever won without any kind of boosting being involved. So these are the two, uh, two ways of doing this, two ways of thinking about it. Uh, we might finish a little bit early for once, but last uh, example I wanted to talk about is stacking, which is also an ensemble method. So let's say back to classification, we have classification problem again. Very simple height and age, and we have some, uh, some outcome that we want to predict, gender. What you do in stacking is you train a sequence of classifier models. So we train model one, doesn't matter what it is. We get some outcomes. Uh, well, this is actually very accurate. Uh, we train model two, we get some outcome. We train model three, which is, falls off the slide. We get some outcome. And what you do in stacking to combine all of these is you just add these to the data set as new features. So you get a new data set that says, these are my original features. This is what model one thought. This is what model two thought. This is what model three thought. thought. And then on this, you train another uh, classifier, which is called the combiner, which combines the original features with the judgments of the ensemble and learns how to combine these, uh, these different uh, judgments. And what this gets you is that your combiner can actually make a judgment saying, well, if the height is very short and the age is a little older, in that case, model two always gets it right, so then I'm gonna listen to model two. But if the age is very young and the height is very tall, then model three is always better. So in that case, I'm gonna listen to model three. What you can do if you just fit something like logistic regression to this, um, or something else, but uh, uh, then you can uh, make these judgments, and for specific points in your feature space, you can use judgments of different models. So it's usually logistic regression, but you can use anything you like. And final comment, if you use neural networks, 
for the ensemble. So these points here are your original models and your combiner. If you use neural networks here, then the whole thing becomes basically one big neural network, which is just wired up into a certain way. And you can actually, during training, you can take the error from this node here, this combiner node, and backpropagate it down to the models below it. And this tells us the both similarity and the difference between deep learning and ensembling. Namely that ensembling is a kind of, uh, you can think of ensembling as a kind of wide learning as opposed to deep learning. So deep learning is drawing structures like this and increasing the number of layers. And ensembling is drawing structures like this and increasing the width and increasing the number of nodes. And this is why deep learning is generally considered more interesting than wide learning. Because um, ultimately what you get with ensembling is nothing more than this segmentation of your instance space. And it might be a very clever segmentation and you might learn a lot about which model to use in which part of your instance space. But it doesn't get you what deep learning gets you, which is that you build up representations from your instance space step by step and you build up representations to new layers, uh, new levels of, of abstraction. Like we saw in the ConfNet example where you build up from feature detectors to nose and eye detectors to face detectors. Uh, so that's something deep learning can do that ensembling can't do. Nevertheless, if you want to win Kaggle competitions or if you want to get a certain amount of performance out of your machine learning algorithm, boosting is a very popular, uh, well, ensembling is a very popular and very effective way to do it. That's all I had for today. So we're 10 minutes early. Uh, so thank you for your attention and I will see you next Monday. <laughs>